Greetings, Corpse Clubbers, and welcome to a brand new episode of Corpse Club, the official podcast for DailyDead.com. My name is Heather Wixon, and if you've been following along on the site for the last few weeks, you know we are in the midst of Indie Horror Month over here on Daily Dead. And I am thrilled uh, for this episode to be talking to, I would say, probably one of the more prolific names in the world of independent horror, uh, Travis Stevens, who has been producing for years. Now he's directing. I mean, there's really nothing that uh, when I think of like sort of the modern movement of independent horror, um, Travis, you're probably one of the first names that pop into my head. So thanks so much for being here today. It's a pleasure. Uh, I feel very lucky and I'm excited to talk about indie horror because it's there's a lot of great stuff happening. in this. There really, really is. Um, I mean, especially from your perspective, like we're going to we're going to talk a little bit about your background and everything like that. But I think for me, the catalyst for for wanting to do this again was sort of seeing what happened in 2020, um, where studios decided they had to sort of hold on to some stuff till this year, um, which kind of left the other side of the industry um, to do a lot of the heavy lifting for us and keep us entertained while we're all sort of hunkering down at home and things like that. From your perspective, was it kind of interesting to see sort of all of these movies that I think in a lot of cases probably would have gone overlooked, kind of get their moments uh, to get out there and shine a little bit with fans? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and I guess that's the way the world works, right? When there's a, there's a, a need for product and a, you know a, a gap in the supply of that product independent producers of the product have a shot to maybe get onto shelves uh when they normally wouldn't have and and that was a, a very dry way of saying it was fucking hilarious to see a movie like the wretched uh be you know placing so highly in the theatrical grosses at the beginning of of uh, the lockdown, because that's something that would normally never happen in, in uh, a normal world. Uh, and then you see it and it just feels like a huge win for independent filmmakers and definitely for indie horror filmmakers. Yeah, I think it's funny because I think how it worked out was that, you know, because a lot of the drive-ins around the country were doing like these repertory screenings of different movies and things like that. And I think we were right, right in the throes of like Empire Strikes Back had been out for a few weeks at drive-ins. So that was like the number one movie again out of nowhere, which was kind of funny. And then all of a sudden The Wretched comes along and I think it dethroned Empire Strikes Back. So you have this tiny little movie about witches and like creatures, you know, made for I think less than a million, uh, come along and dethrone Star Wars of all things. And I think they were number one for like three weeks, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I, you know, it's just the little guy can win if they get a shot up to the plate and, uh, you know, it's inspiring. That's awesome. So I'm curious, you know, for those of, for for those out there listening and things like that, um, you know, that may not know a lot about your background. Like we we've known each other for years now. I would say probably going on about ten years at least. Yeah. Um, what you know, kind of going back even, but like further than that. Like, what was sort of the catalyst for your career in terms of, you know, was there a certain moment when you were, you know, kind of growing up and you realized, like, you know. I want to make movies. Like, was there just like that, that sort of aha moment that you had um, where you knew this is where you were destined to be? Yeah, I mean, I, my first memories of being alive uh, are, are um, watching a horror movie through the vent in the back of my, my family's van at a drive-in. And um, so like movies and, and scary movies, I grew up in Vermont, Friday the 13th, watching that as as a kid um it felt so true to the environment that i was in that i just connected really just strongly to it and whether it was reading stephen king or, or whatever books like just horror was just a part of of the day-to-day -day. and when i got older into my teens um and started sort of creating stuff it would be skateboard magazines or skate videos or uh, artwork. That sort of creativity, there, you know, horror was always just sort of a a, a part of that um, 
vocabulary. And so I think when, you know, I went to college, uh, I wasn't making strictly horror movies. There's, there's other types of movies I like and, and there's other stuff I was making, but we definitely did make horror movies. We made um, a sort of a, a Blair Witch style fake doc about uh, some folklore researchers who go missing in the woods and we made that a couple of years before the Blair Witch came out. Um, and so it's just, yeah, it's always, it's always been there. And I've, I don't know, I just, uh, I like it. And I think, you know, it's very malleable genre. So what, whatever point I'm at in my life and whatever, you know, stuff I'm, I'm processing as a human or as an artist, horror, you know, is a good medium to incorporate that into. Excellent. So I'm curious because, you know, sometimes like when your geography can sort of dictate where your, where your path goes. Um, so you were East coast. Um, were you, did you end up doing anything over that side or did you realize like if you really wanted to be in this industry and thriving, like you had to make the move to the Los Angeles area? Yeah. It, so the, my senior year of college, I, I went to a liberal well, a hippie college basically a <laughs> converted barn that they somehow uh, convinced people was a college but uh up until my senior year uh this was the mid 90s so up until my senior year i literally thought oh you can make movies anywhere and you make one good enough and it will get into sundance and you know you'll change the world because this was the sort of uh tarantino Kevin Smith, uh, Robert Rodriguez, uh, Allison Anders era. So I was planning to just stay in Vermont and just make, make movies. And I think two or three weeks before our senior year ended, uh, two of my filmmaking buddies were like, yeah, we're moving to California. Uh, you should come. And I was like, oh, oh okay. And so I just got in the car with them and we just uh, drove across country. And, you know, I now recognize that if you're gonna go to film school, there's, you have to get a good sense of, of what the film school is gonna offer your career. I certainly did not go to a school that helped set us up for a successful career, although it was a lot of fun and allowed us to make whatever we wanted. But when I did arrive in LA in the mid nineties, uh, it took years and years and years, basically starting from the bottom to figure out how the business works, you know, working for free, interning, doing script coverage for free, eventually getting paid to do script coverage, eventually getting an assistant position, eventually, you know, slowly working, working up and up and up. Um, so yeah, I didn't know anything basically about the movie business and really just stumbled around blindly and, and just uh, have even up through directing have just sort of um, taken the opportunities as they've come. Well, it's interesting because I think a lot of folks like they, and this is something I've even experienced sort of like even in the special effects realm where like the way everything is these days because there is so much information out there um, like you can go to YouTube and I think almost YouTube would probably at this point, if, if somebody really wanted to take themselves to film school independently, like between, I would say watching special features, like good old, like the old school special features is like, they're like, like 90 minutes long and like watching stuff on YouTube, you could get a pretty good sense of like what you need to be doing, um, to go out there and just start making your stuff. Um, and I think the same thing is, is true for like special effects. Um, but I think there's also a generation of people who sort of have that they they just want to immediately jump in to the deep end without sort of working their way from the shallow waters um and they forget that you know i, I think it makes sense to like go out there and pay your dues um because i think ultimately in the end that's what's going to make you stronger and you know have longevity in this industry because if you have that kind of background you know you know all of the different facets and like even looking at like your you know your credits and IMDb like sure you've got a ton of producing credits and got directing credits but like you know you were you know doing story stuff and you were doing you know 
doing music supervision and on, on different movies and doing, you know, PA work and things like that. Like, it, you know, I, I think having a well-rounded resume um, is only going to help you, you know, if you want to have any sort of longevity. Yeah. I mean, we, I have this conversation a lot with um, because it, it seems like um, in this era where the, the um, tech technology makes it very easy for people to create uh, a polished looking content. Uh, so we're in this era where more and more people are finding it easier to make stuff, which has a huge value and, and it's good, uh, you know, opportunity and, and people's access is, is uh, all improved. So that's good. But one thing that seems to be missing from our current system is uh, mentorship and really learning the craft under someone um, because that sort of education is going to save you so much time and, and mistakes. I feel like whether it's screenwriting or producing or directing, we are getting, it's easier to make stuff now, but the stuff itself maybe isn't quite up to what it used to be or what it could be because we're making, we're learning as we, as we make it. Um, so not to sound like an old curmudgeon, I'm sure every era of filmmaking or, or any business, you know, has its, has its drawbacks, but it does seem if you can learn your craft under someone who you respect, you might really benefit from it before you go and try to make your own thing. And for me, I, you know, literally was just taking whatever job I could could get and not getting anywhere closer to making a movie. And got to, I had the opportunity to work for uh, producer Pierre David, who had produced um, Videodrome and Scanners. Like, like I know Pierre. Yeah. Well, I, I worked at Imagination for a year. Oh. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Small yeah, yeah. world. Yeah, there we go. So, so for with like in, in my case, and, and maybe for you too, working under someone with that amount of experience, and you you learn stuff that you would never even think about if you were just focused on creating. Uh, and it's I will never uh, be at his level of organization, uh, business savvy, economic uh, uh, sort of intuitiveness. But there are tons of little tiny things I took away from, from my time under him that to this day uh, have you know, made me better prepared. So it is something that when, when you know, I talk with filmmakers on their way up who are frustrated about not having opportunities or, or maybe the, the work not being quite what they want it to be, it's, it's something that I've encouraged, which is, there is value to learning from someone if you have that that opportunity, um, and you know maybe that's that is film school for some people. Uh, like on the uh, Team Deacons podcast, they always ask people, "Did you go to film school?" And you know the answers vary. Um, some people find it useful because maybe they're shy, and that gives them a, a chance to to make connections with collaborators that can then set them up for the next part of their career or maybe film school has some professors or some some industry contacts that'll help set you up like it, it can have value for people but maybe also you know working for a, a, a screenwriter that you really respect could give you the same sort of education or you know working under a DP you know, all of these things are, are, are things I encourage people to do. That was a very long, long answer. Sorry. <laughs> do not apologize. It's, it's so funny. I always forget that you were, you were at Imagination before I was, um, which is, is kind of interesting because I think, you know, it's one thing to make your movie, but I think there's also having the understanding of how to get then get your movie sold, um, which I think is a, is a sort of a, 
a, a hurdle for a lot of filmmakers. Um, and for me, like even, you know, I'm not a filmmaker myself, um, but just knowing that side of the business now and having an understanding of like, you know, if you're, you would, you know, push a movie di to different territories differently. And there's, you know, different things that they're looking for in terms of like artwork or titles or things like that. I mean, being able to have that experience on top of everything else that you've done. I mean, I'm guessing that really had to give you an idea, you know, as you were, you know, continuing to progress in your career, you know, producing more and more and ultimately taking, you know, the steps forward towards directing. I, I'm guessing that kind of knowledge was also pretty invaluable to sort of have in your pocket as well. Yeah. It, it teaches you how to break the, the thing down into individual elements and, you know, I guess it'd be like if you went to medical school, your understanding of the human body would change. And, you know, it's similar to that. Like when you're, when you're being creative, you can point the, the movie in a direction to, you know, um, exaggerate or diminish certain qualities or, or whatever. It's just all good information to have, good education to have. Um, yeah, I, it's it's been great, and even if the the you know the decision you end up making is I'm going to do this regardless of of these other external factors, at least you're consciously doing it, knowing what the the uh, ramifications might be, you know, and and that's something that you you know in our case you get if you're showing five horror movie trailers for eight hours a day to buyers from around the world, you get a sense of what, what works for some people and doesn't work for others, what works for everybody. You, that feedback, you know, is really valuable. And it, it just increases your understanding of, of what you're making. Absolutely. Um, also, I love how you mentioned Videodrome because every day I went to that office, I coveted that Videodrome poster like so hard <laughs> I just feel like yeah. I, I just stand her first and be in awe that I'm like I'm working in an office where this is like hanging up but then also be like god I really want this poster so bad <laughs> and I'd be like do you know how cool you are Pierre I don't think you do um you know but yeah I just I for me that was like you know it, it, as much as everybody wants to say it's about art and it is because everybody wants to create art in some way um whether you're a filmmaker, you're somebody who draws, you know, I think art is very intrinsic to the human nature or to our human nature. Um, but ultimately in, in a lot of cases, art has to lead to commerce. And I think, you know, you have to have sort of in a lot of film schools, and this is a conversation I had with my other half, because when he was going through film school, nobody talked about that kind of stuff. It was just mostly about how do you make the, th make the stuff. And he had so many friends who was going through the program with him that ultimately ended up doing really nothing in the industry because nobody really prepared them for the other side of it. Um, maybe it's a little bit different now, but that was like early 2000s where it was just mostly about like, well, how do you make the stuff? Um, so I think, you know, for anybody out there, like having any sort of information about like, okay, I want to make a movie okay, I've made a movie now with my friends and it's great, but like, where, what's next, you know? And I think, you know, that's why I wanted to ask you because I feel like people sharing that kind of information, I think is just invaluable um, because I think there are a lot of filmmakers out there who it, it's, the process is very daunting, you know, especially if you don't really have a lot of connections and you don't really know what your next steps are, um, you know, and then you just sort of have this thing on your hands and you just don't know what to do with it. Yeah, I mean, it's, I, I talk about this a lot, not because I think I'm some uh, expert with all of the answers, but I share what my experience was like it, on the off chance that it helps someone else who's in a similar situation and helps them understand, oh, okay, what I'm experiencing is not unique. I mean, that was the main thing for me for the first 10 years I was in LA, I just had no idea if what I was doing was getting me closer to making movies or not, and it wasn't. And so, you know, talking about this stuff and saying, hey, here's some aspect that might, uh, you know, help you achieve your goal. Like, I talk about it all the time, simply hoping that it maybe saves somebody else 
some time <laughs> and they <laughs> get to making movies uh, earlier and, and not just making movies, but having a sustainable career. Because um, like you said, sometimes people can uh, get a movie made, but maybe it doesn't uh, lead to the next movie. Uh, and so and I think conversations like this, you know, hope, with more people, not just with us, but hopefully the more people talk about this, the easier it will be to navigate the business for, for people coming into it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and of course, you mentioned making a movie and then going on to making your next one. And, you know, obviously you produced tons of movies prior to doing uh, Girl on the Third Floor a few years ago. Um, but I'm curious because now, you know, we are, Jacob's wife is officially out there as of when this is going to be airing. Um, and I'm just curious, was it, how different was the process for you the second time around versus the first time? Was there, I mean, even though you've been working, you know, in the industry, like, were there jitters with girls, on, girl on the foot, third floor? Like, were you still a little nervous? Yeah. Cause I mean, you're putting yourself out there in a very different way. Yeah, I think, I mean, the, the process of making the movie feels very similar in terms of, um, analyzing what you're trying to do with the movie, breaking down a budget and an approach to making the movie that allows you to get the most amount of movie on screen for the money you have, um, the actual day-to-day -day of shooting the movie, uh, editing the movie and, and, and releasing the movie, all of that was, is very similar if, you know, if you're a certain type of producer or, or a director, but, the thing that is significantly different is you can't, um, if you're a producer and a movie doesn't work, you can say, ah, the movie didn't work. But if you're the you know, creative voice of the movie and it doesn't work, then you feel like maybe you failed. So there's, a, <laughs> there's definitely more, more anxiety there. And, you know, I think as a, as a writer director, I'm still learning and, you know, trying to um, take everything, you know, that I learned as a producer, but not make, not think like I know everything there is to know. Like I'm still trying to go into these things with an open mind and going into each project, trying to identify areas that I could improve on areas that maybe somebody is more talented than me uh, and might bring a different perspective to a project. So it's basically, even though I've made a bunch of movies, I still am approaching it as a student or at least trying to. That's awesome. I, and I think too, cause I know um, with Jacob's wife, um, this was something I think Barbara had sort of approached you about um, because it came to her initially and it was something she fell in love with. Um, do you feel like, because, you know, this is very much sort of this female empowerment story and, you know, and, and Barbara's character is really, you know, the heart of this and watching this woman sort of come into her own and sort of figure out, you know, what her place is in this world now after, you know, things change for her so drastically. Um, even though it's out, I'm still gonna be a little vague because I don't want to ruin things for everybody. Um, but I'm, I'm curious, like being able to have a collaborative partner like Barbara on this, you know, how, how much did it really help you in terms of being able to sort of dig into the themes, you know, that are at the core of this story um, and get a better understanding because, you know, there, there are certain things that are universal for, for everybody, but I think there's a distinctly feminine perspective that's in this movie um, that really shines through. And, and, you know, and of course that comes, you know, through the character that Barbara plays. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm glad because that was the, that was the thing that, interested me in doing the movie in the first place, which was, it was so clear the parallels between the Anne character and Barbara's uh, professional, uh, personal life, where she was now wanting to um, use her voice more and have more control over the, the, the types of movies she's making. And so, the reason why I wanted to do it was because I wanted to help 
and be involved in that process. And so when we were working on the script and, and making the movie, making the time for those conversations and, and creating the space for her to really explore that stuff. Um, and we, we had conversations about, you know, what her marriage has been like and what are the little things that, you know, her husband does that annoys her and how do they make up and how do they split the, uh, you know, the chores and, and all of those things. That wasn't a, a, uh, you know, hey, you should do this or you should have this. It was just the, the, the act of having the conversations and looking for ways to incorporate that in the movie is empowering beyond what the movie is doing itself, the actual act of making the movie was uh, uh, empowering. And it was really, you know, I was really grateful to, to do that because making the thing is just as rewarding as the, the movie itself. You know, you're supposed to be getting pleasure out of creating and working with Barbara uh, on fleshing these characters out in this world out um, was it was very rewarding and I, I sort of looked at it you know pretentiously was like oh you know like like when Martin Scorsese did Alice doesn't live here anymore with Alan Bernstein um, you know I, I don't know just that idea of like working with a really really talented uh, lead actress to create a really feminist uh, stories it just was really appealing that's great and i'm curious too because you know you've worked with barbara and larry before um on projects that you've produced um and you know you also brought in you know like phil from girl on the third floor as well um is it cool to like you know I'm sure it's cool to be out there making movies, but is it even better when you're getting to sort of do it with people that you're friends with and that you are, have a connection with and that you've already sort of been in the trenches with, like how much easier does it make it for you uh, when you are able to sort of be able to collaborate with people that you already sort of have a shorthand with? Yeah, it's, it's makes a, a world of difference. And it's something that um, I have so much respect for the filmmaking and acting sort of uh, teams that, that come up together and work uh, together again and again and again. Uh, because not only do you, uh, you know, learn as an individual, but as a group, you learn how to work better as a group. And that's something that as a producer, we're often, you know, jumping around the country or different countries finding you know the best economic place to shoot a movie and that sometimes means you can't bring everybody from the last movie on to the next uh as a filmmaker it's definitely a thing that that i want to do more and more and more of because um you can really tailor tailor the movie to people's strengths and you can get uh i think a better result out of it so i'm um, yeah, it's definitely something I admire. There, there's filmmakers uh, like Joe Begos and Josh Ethier, um, you know, Adam Wingard, Simon Barrett, you know, people who, who have worked together again and again and again, and their work continues to improve because uh, they're, they're partnering over and over again. So I admire that. Yeah, I'm. Uh, it's it's been so fun to see, like so many careers, and we talked about this like shortly before we started recording. But just seeing so many careers flourish over the years, and you know, you mentioned Joe Bagos, which I still you know remember the first time watching Almost Human, you know, and realizing they you know, for such a small budget on that movie, and how they were able to really to sort of knock my proverbial socks off with you know with that, and then just seeing them continue to evolve uh, into essentially that one two punch of bliss and VFW. Um, for me, like it's 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 kind of fun. It's almost like being like the grown up watching like your kids grow up in a way because I'm a little bit older than they are too. So it's just kind of like fun where you're like, wow, look at them go. Like I just I, for me, it's exciting. Like I love seeing people that I've covered early on in my career. Um, 
like really come into their own in new ways. Um, you know, as, as the, the earth keeps spinning and things like that. Um, I just think it's really fun. And I think that's, a t you know, for anybody out there, you know, I think it's a testament, like say, if you're, you know, if your first movie, you don't have a ton of money, like just get out there and get it made, you know, in it's something, you know what I mean? Like it's your first step and you never know what your next steps are going to be. Um, and you know, for me, it just, it makes me really excited about, so, you know, especially on the independent side of things, because that really is where the biggest risks are being, you know, taken in terms of story and, you know, people really just having a lot of fun. And it, I give it a lot of credit to you and guys like Joe and things like that. We're like, it's just so refreshing to see movies that embrace special effects again. Um, which is something that I love because, you know, so many times when I'm like, you know, talking to people working on studio movies, they're like, oh, you know, well, we did these things because it was more cost, you know, time effective. And so, you know, we did a little VFX here and there. And I'm like, just get messy. Like, just go out there and get messy. Like, I would rather it be imperfect and messy and fun as opposed to it needing to be, you know, something that looks amazing because you were able to digitally augment it. You know, um, I just I miss that sort of just have fun with it. And I think for me, that's why I've always loved, you know, sort of the independent side of this genre is because it really is where everybody, are, everybody is taking the biggest risks. Yeah, you have the, the luxury uh, of less, um, less concerns about, you know, um, losing audience members, or whatever, you can, you can go a bit more punk, a bit more wild with it. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's fun. I mean, I, I, I know that at a certain level, you need resources to pull off, off certain um, visions. You know, yeah. uh, we, we noticed on We Are Still Here, we could not make a movie like The Conjuring, even though they're both haunted house movies, because The Conjuring had the money to build the sets so that you could do the camera moves like that. And, and coordinate, uh, you know, atmosphere, uh, camera movement, actors, score, all that stuff. And we we're like, well, we can't do that because we, we simply don't have the resources to achieve that. So what can we do within our means that uh, will give this movie its own personality? And I think that's part of the, the creative fun of working in the uh, lower budget space is finding those things that you can do that are not, uh, you know, dictated by money. But on the other hand, I totally respect. And certainly now that I'm writing and directing, I can see the desire for more resources <laughs> to make bigger and bigger <laughs> movies <laughs> because it fucking sucks trying to pull this shit off with not enough money. <laughs> <laughs> and people are like yeah i mean you, you can kind of see the seams of it and it's like yeah no shit <laughs> because yeah. you know yeah it was made with scotch tape and bubble gum like yeah we were there we have eyes too <laughs> yeah well i think also too i think there's a lot of people and you know i really try to do this um when i'm looking at any sort of movie is you know i think so many people are caught up in the idea of perfection with their entertainment mm. and realistically like when i was a kid a movie didn't need to be perfect for me to in, enjoy it and i yeah. think you know ultimately too like i think we're just we're so hypercritical of things these days where i'm just like relax a little bit and just give yourself over to the movie like i don't care if i see somebody's you know if i see like a seam on an appliance or like or if I see like somebody's wire or something like, is it taking away from the story? Not even a little bit because so many of us grew up with movies where those scenes were like way more than evident. Like I love Silver Bullet. That is one of the worst werewolf costumes ever. But that doesn't mean I love that movie any less. I don't care because that movie is still so good. Like I don't care that he looks like a giant teddy bear. Like it doesn't matter to me because I was still caught up in that story. And I just think people get so focused on these details. Like I get if you know, you wanna call people out for like being sloppy or things like that, but like ultimately seems are okay. It's okay because you know what? It's, it's art and art, you know, it's doesn't have to be 
pitch perfect. Like I can't even imagine like somebody like Monet when he's making art and doing, you know, these little strokes and stuff where that was such a different thing than most artists were doing at the time. Do you think people were, were like mad at him because it didn't look perfect? Like, I just, I think people get a little too caught up in that stuff. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's true. Any sort of, I mean, if the audience is, is, is sort of accustomed to seeing things one way, um, when a, a, a a uh, piece of work does something different, then it takes a while for the audience to recalibrate or and understand, oh, this is what art can be, or art can also be this. And certainly in in fine arts, that happens all the, all the time. I'm I'm reading this um this book uh, right now on uh, Marcel Duchamp and his sort of trajectory through. Basically, in France, they would have the equivalent of film festivals, but for paintings. And so while um, the Dadis were coming in and the Cubists and all that stuff. Every time they put a new style of painting in front of the, the, the audiences, there'd be like riots. Like this is an art. This is like an outrage. This is anarchy. And, you know, maybe that applies to, to movies as well. Um, I mean, it's funny too, with like, I'm sure for you growing up and for me, there was, you would kind of have enough context before you started watching the movie to know what kind of movie you were in for, uh, whether it was, you know, the, the, the posters outside the theater or, you know, the video box, video box art in the, in the video store. Like you kind of knew what style movie you were going to watch. Um, and that made it a little easier to sort of view the movie on its own terms. And I wonder if there's there's an aspect of now that so much of our, our content is just sort of suddenly available, if while watching it, it kind of takes a second to 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 understand what the movie's doing and if that, you know, impacts our, our enjoyment of it or not. I mean, I was just talking with somebody on Twitter about this of like re-watching a new movie, you know, a second time soon after you you've watched it the first time, like it's such a different experience uh, because you're, you've already, you know, ex watched it on, uh, you've already observed it and now you can really sort of uh, watch it on its own terms. I don't yeah. know. I'm babbling. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you know, when we, we've talked about doing this, we, um, one of the things I wanted to do is because I think we are in a very, um exciting period of, of indie horror so you you know i mentioned like oh we should definitely like sort of dig into some of the new stuff that's out there um i hate saying the word marketplace because it makes it sound so commercial but i mean ultimately you know it is a marketplace you know at the end of the day um and i you picked a really fun array of movies for us to kind of talk about um and i wanted to start with come true because this is a movie that I saw last year and I, it just had not left me. And I rewatched it because I interviewed um, Anthony for it uh, a f probably about like a month ago or so. And it was interesting because my other half, like most of the times when I'm watching stuff for work, I would say he maybe sits down with me for about 30% of it. Um, and he was walking through when I had just started come true and found himself like so enraptured with it. Like he like was like, okay, well, I'll just work after this is done. <laughs> so he kind of got found himself getting really caught up in it. And I think for me, it's it really is one of the most uh exemplary sort of movies I've seen in a while, simply because it does something that I just I haven't seen done in like in a long time in terms of taking on this concept of nightmares and how we sort of manifest them, you know, and it just sounds hyperbolic, but pretty much since the original Nightmare on Elm Street. Yeah, I mean, I, I wanna preface by saying, you know, the movies I picked are ones that I think are uh, exceptional and, and successful despite the limited budgets they were made with. So, so you know, I, I can enjoy and love a movie, uh, you know, like uh, The Invisible Man, say, or, or Freaky, you know, like, you know, a, a bigger budget studio horror film. So, but they have more resources, uh, more experience level, 
from the people working on it. There's there's more um, more more uh, talent and and resources there, so their end results you know should be better. So these are the movies that are great without all of those. They're great purely because of of uh, the creative vision and the talent of the very few people who were involved to pull it off. So I think with would come true. There's such a, a, a tone there that is kind of wild because we're jumping between a, a dreamy reality and a really, really aggressive nightmare landscape. And how Anthony sort of gets us in and uh, gets us back and forth between those two worlds is really effective. And just, I mean, I just sat there the first time just wondering how they did it. Like, how did you do this on such a modest budget? Because the movie feels, you know, feels much bigger than it is. And I think it all comes down to the imagination he had when he was making it and finding a way to create these individual nightmare landscapes work with people just on those sections, work with other people on, on the, the real world sections, and then you know, took the time to really seamlessly uh, blend them together, which I guess is what all filmmaking is. But in, in this case, like you said, I mean, it, it really does take you to a nightmarish world and you don't normally see that world depicted in such a big, bold way on a movie that's budgeted at this level. Yeah, it was interesting because when I, I spoke with him, I didn't realize um, that all the nightmare stuff was all like visual effects. I mean, it makes sense now, um, but I was, cause I, I just sort of assumed that they just kind of like went and shot in like a dark place or, you know what I mean? And just kind of did it that way. But the fact that they did uh, like all of like these really like, in, hugely impressive visual effects for those setups like that it was just it's gorgeous and it's scary and it's really eerie um and I was just like that to me blew me away because I've seen I've seen movies with much bigger budgets uh that relied on visual effects less and those those visual effects sort of stood out as more like oh they didn't feel as natural I guess um and I also just think it's really cool because like it's so hard, I think, to pull off like a nightmarish like world. Like it's just so hard to like conceptualize it because everybody's nightmares are different and they look different, they feel different. And the way that he really leans into this sort of just ominous feeling, um, you know, from the get go, you, you just know from the, the, the start of the movie, something's off and it just keeps amping up from there. Um, I, it just to me is like, it just became such a stunning experience where I was like, the first time I saw it, I loved it. And the second time I saw it, I was just like, I was just, I'm, I'm still in awe of it. And the fact that they were able to make this movie with what they had available. I mean, I think it's, it's almost like a mini film school for people if they want to check it out because there's, they don't have the money for so there's a there's a there's a scientific almost uh, let's say Cronenbergian aspect of of this where there's a, a sort of a research facility and and they're studying dreams, but they don't have the money to really build some huge lab or or you know fill it with tons of extras and stuff like that. But you watch the movie and it still has the kinetic energy without those elements because of how clever they are with what they're doing in the frame. And so like one simple example is the uh, head, head uh, research, uh, I guess doctor maybe, you know, he's got these big 1970s style eyeglasses that are reflecting TV monitors in front of them that are flickering. And so even though it's just a shot of a, a guy's face, you feel this big sci-fi world in there because they just, put them in the right glasses that could reflect these blinking lights. These are like little things that don't cost money. They just take awareness and, and creativity. 
And I think when people watch this from a purely analytical level, there are so many lessons you can take from it uh, in your own films to give your own films more scope, energy, uh, and life. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's scary, it's fun, it's wonderful. You can enjoy it as a movie. But for people who are making genre stuff, I think there's a, it's a really great example of how to do it well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and another movie you brought up, um, which I don't, I don't know if it has a release yet, um, but I'm really glad you brought this one up. It's The Strings from Ryan Glover, um, because I saw that out of uh, Salem Horror Fest in October. And again, it's a, a movie that was probably made like, you know, with, with an exceptional, like a very tight shoestring budget. Um, and again, I haven't been able to shake it either. And I think one is the music uh, really does a fantastic job. And I, I owe that, you know, a lot of that is due to Tegan in the movie. Um, but like, I, I'm really hoping somebody picks this movie up soon because I think it definitely deserves to be seen by as many people as possible. Yeah. For people who haven't seen it, it's a, it's a quiet little sort of haunting movie about a young woman who goes to, uh, I think it's her family's uh, property. I think it might be like her aunt's house or something like that. You know, in a little sort of off season beach, beach community. And she's, she's supposed to be recording a new album. She's a musician. And what the filmmaker Ryan Glover and Tegan, the, the star sort of, uh, you know, uh, I don't know if she's the composer as well. No, I guess Adrian Ellis is the composer, but she she performs a lot of music in it. They, what they achieve is this sort of beautiful, poetic, haunting look at what creating feels like when you're trying to find inspiration, you're trying to, 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 to pursue an idea, you get a little spark of a thing, and you, you kind of run with it and then it peters out and then you refine it. Like they're able to do that, but then this sense of evil starts sort of throbbing in this, in this environment. And is it in her head? Is it in the house? Is it in the, the, the town? All this sort of ambiguousness, uh, just sort of keeps building and building and building. And again, a movie where maybe there's not a lot of elements on screen, but what is on screen has such cinematic quality to it because they're just choosing their shots really well. The music and the sound design is really great. And the performance is so sort of mesmerizing. Uh, so it's a really, it's just a fun experience. It's a small movie, but I just think it really does so much. There's, it does so much cinematically with its limited uh, uh, elements. Yeah, and I think for me too, because I I have zero musical inclinations whatsoever. Um, I used to play flute like growing up, but like that's, that is the, the extent of it. Um, but I think what it was really great about it is in that movie, you know, Tegan's character, uh, Catherine, like, the sort of the the creative process that she's go, uh, like putting her or she's experiencing through this film, um, I think in a lot of ways is relatable to I think anybody um, because we all sort of have those moments of frustration where we in, and have those moments of self doubt and I think for me, um, it's the the, the sort of the, the humanity of her character. Um, it just made me really it made it really easy for me to kind of get caught up in her story. And find myself getting creeped out as like she's, you know, isolated away from the world. And then all this weird stuff starts to happen. And she starts having these like sort of weird, you know, visions of things and things like that. Like to me, you know, the movie lives and dies by Tegan's performance. And she's so like, I just got her. Like I wanted to hang out with her. I totally got her um, and her character. And I just thought there was something really interesting about, again, how it is very, you know, driven by music, but ultimately I think anybody who's been drawn to being creative can get a lot out of this experience as well, because I think we've all had the frustrations 
uh, that sh- her character has in this movie to one degree or another. Yeah, I- I'm so glad you, you you mentioned Tegan's performance because it just makes me realize like there is a swagger and a confidence to her performance and that character. It's as if you were watching uh, Charlie Theron or Natalie Portman or you know some big famous actor playing a uh, 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 rock star. It has that that sort of quality of swagger to it, but it's just on this much smaller scale. Like there's the character is talented and troubled, and you get. You want her, even though you you don't see this character, you know, playing in front of you know thousands of people cheering in just her phone calls with her management and just uh, the music that she's making by herself. You feel what a star she is, and it all comes down to just how fucking good that performance is and how good the filmmaking is at at sort of what details it's showing you about her. So. Yeah, it's it's really fun. It's like it's like a couple of people got together and made something really beautiful and complex, like in a little tiny bubble. I, I can't wait for people to see it. Yeah. So if, if anybody's out there listening and you have the means, like find this movie, get this movie out there, because I think this is definitely one that like I, I think fans are going to really get a lot out of. Like I, for me, it's always great when I see like these little movies that like kind of come in and out of these festivals and you just don't know like what's going to happen to them. Like in, in many cases, like, you know, some films like go to festivals and they've already got their distribution locked in. Um, And then other, you know, films, you're just like, okay, let's, let's see what happens here. Um, And I think like, even looking back at like, in the case of like Salem Horror Fest, um, I saw some really innovative, fun movies out of that festival that were, you know, definitely on the, the, the micro budget level. But yet you have directors out there who are trying to do something different. Like, I, I don't know if you saw Danny and the Vampire, but I thought that was really clever and no. different. Okay. And yeah, and it was super fun. It was just like this girl who like, again, it's like she's sort of caught up in like this like group of people who hunts down vampires, but then she befriends a vampire and then becomes like sort of a funny road trip movie um, all through like Los Angeles. And again, like... I know that movie wasn't made for a ton of money, but I didn't care. Like it just, it really works because of the performance performances. So I'm really hoping that some of these movies from Salem that I know haven't quite been nabbed yet. Like, you know, I I really hope that people, you know, somebody out there will find them and give them a good home and get them out there so that they can be enjoyed by fans. But yeah, the strings for me, like, I feel like that's like a perfect November, December movie where yeah. it's chilly outside and you just want to like hunker down and watch something creepy. And that's like the perfect, like great winter horror movie for me. Yeah. And maybe for some of the horror fans out there, you might want a, a second feature to be able to put on afterwards because it is a very small movie and you might feel the need to make a double feature to get to a bit more out of your evening. But yes, 100%. A, a, yeah. a glass of, uh, you know, cider with some rum in it and a blanket <laughs> and, and watch it. Yeah. It's funny. Cause you mentioned, obviously, you know, we are still Hill that you worked on. And I was, I actually thought when I was watching this, I was like, you know, I think in a lot of ways, like if you were looking for sort of like the amuse bouche to your evening, like you could start with the strings and then go into, we are still here because that also has that very chilly atmosphere to it as well. Um, so I think they would be really great companions uh, for, for a double feature. Yeah. So, and it also still blows my mind that that movie was six years ago now. I still can't believe it. I feel like that was like two or three years ago. So I have no idea where time has gone. Yeah, I know. And, and, and in making these movies, like because we were basically going back to back to back to back out of necessity because you, you have to just keep working or you're not going to pay your rent. Um, like they, it's a blur. It's all a blur because not only do you, are you making you're making one, then you're premiering another, then another one's being released, and it just keeps repeating and repeating. So the last you know ten years, really, I can't tell you which what movie was what year basically because it's all just a big giant uh, you know tumbling around in the undercurrent of a big ocean. 
Yeah, it's it kind of blows my mind a little bit because um, there's some movies where I'm like, wait, I covered that in 2013. Wasn't that just like two years ago? I've lost all sort of concept of time, but I think also 2020 had something to do with that yeah. as well. <laughs> yeah, that's true. So I still feel like we're just in one big year at this point, even though we're we're well into 2021 at this at this point. But I'm still kind of like, oh yeah, you know, last year or this year, it's you know, and I'm talking about 2019 at that point. So <laughs> yeah. The, the last year time became very elastic. <laughs> it really, really has. Um, well, I wanted to, you know, another movie you, you, you mentioned on your list, um, and I'm really glad you brought it up, um, is The Stylist, um, which again is a movie. I'd seen the short and I knew what Jill was capable of, but I don't think anything was still able to prepare me for the ending of this movie. Um, and for those of you listening, if you want to watch The Stylist right now, it's currently available to stream exclusively on the Arrow uh, streaming platform, which I just signed up for, um, thanks to another movie on your list. Um, but I've been meaning to do it anyways, and I was like, oh, this is this costs like hardly anything. So I was like, let me just do this. Um, but talk about a knockout feature film debut. Like I... I really have to believe that people are going to be knocking down Jill's door after this movie. I hope so. I mean, I think, I think one of the things that I admire most about it is that she and her partners made it happen. Like you can tell that everything in that movie was DIY and, and, you know, she had made a bunch of shorts and I think had done the, meet around Hollywood trying to get somebody else to, to believe in your project and back your project. And with the stylist, they just went and did it. And they did it and it's great. And I, I find it so, like it's such a victory for everybody. Uh, for Brea and, and Najera, everybody who's in the movie, everybody who worked on it to, to say, hey, we have faith in this filmmaker, we have faith in this story, and we can do it ourselves, and then to go out and do it and have it turn out this good, that's like a triumph. And I think it's something that should be celebrated, and you know, it's awesome that it got distribution, and you know, like you said, hopefully more and more people will see it, and, and we'll get to see more movies from Jill. Yeah, I, I think for me, like what I loved about it is just, it has such a elegance to it, um, and one of the things is because I, um, I, I actually uh, did an in-depth interview with Jill for Indie Horror Month um, to sort of celebrate the movie and kind of keep promoting a little bit because I know a lot of people like, and you know this, like you get a lot of the promotion that comes out like the first week or two of a movie's release. And then for some reason, there's like this weird unwritten rule that like we can't talk about these movies anymore yeah. and nobody does. So I was like, you know, I wanted to kind of get that conversation going again with her. Um, and I told her it was, it was interesting to me because with Najara, like, I just, I know she's an actress and I know she's not a stylist and she's not a beautician. And yet there was such a way that she was able to sort of work. It was almost like a dance, like a choreography in her performance, whenever she was like behind the chair or, you know, during those scenes, like I just almost, it was, it was almost like falling like into sort of like, like when you're almost watching waves crash where you just kind of like in these movements. And it was just such a really interesting way that she does, you know, she approaches this work. Cause like, there's, there's two ways you could have made this movie. Um, and I really love sort of the elegance of this. Um, and I think so much of that comes through Najara's performance. Um, and there's just, there's like, as much as she's doing these horrible things yet, I just, I want to hug her and I feel for her. Um, and I'm totally hypnotized by her throughout this movie. Yeah, I think, you know, if you've had the, the pleasure of seeing some of the reference uh, scenes or, or um, mood boards and stuff that, that Jill put together for this movie, it's for a first feature to have that sort of um, uh, attention to detail and sort of creative intention is really, it's awesome. And, and her lighting designs and her blocking all that stuff, you know, clearly she thought about. And again, for a movie that doesn't have a lot of resources for it to have those kind of layers to what they're doing on screen is 
just a testament to the creativity of the people making the movie. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a, it's, it's like a, a very slick, clean, uh, almost like, a, not cartoonish, but, but uh, exaggerated reality in that film. And, you know, they definitely, they dance around the, the, the scenes yeah, and it's interesting to me too because there's always sort of like this discussion back and forth about like what horror fans are like looking at, looking for out of their endings. Mm -hmm. um, whether they want like the happy ending or if they want sort of that shocking ending. Um, and I think for me, what I love about the stylist is that it definitely sort of takes the latter route where it, it gives you sort of that, that holy shit moment um, once you realize what's happening. And to me, I'm so glad that they went the direction they did because I don't, I don't know that I would have loved the movie as much. And I'm trying to, again, be sort of vague, but it's, it's just such a powerful image um, that comes with that, the, the finale of this, mo this movie um, where it's weirdly empowering, but it's also really sad and horrifying. And there are very few movies that I've seen that have been able to sort of balance out that kind of emotion. But it's, again, it's one of those things where like, you get that sort of that feeling in the pit of your stomach, like about 10 minutes before that things aren't right and something bad is coming. And then you just, there's nothing that prepares you for it. And again, I think Najara like just totally nails that moment with this sort of like wide eye innocence of not realizing sort of what really she's done. And it's just, it's such a knockout moment um, that I just wish more filmmakers would sort of lean into that. Where like, we're like with Jill, what Jill does here is just like, you know, it doesn't feel safe. It doesn't feel like the, and the way you would expect the story to end. Um, and I think for me, that's why, like, I have not been able to shake that image. Um, and it is truly horrifying and really sad at the same time. Yeah, that's the, the benefit of making smaller indie horror films is you can go big, you can go crazy. You know, you can do a thing that maybe wouldn't work on a studio level, who, who maybe wants to play it a bit safer or... or and things a bit more defined. Like, this is great. And I also just want to point out, I think Brea's performance in that movie is such a good counter, counter uh, balance to what Njira's doing. You know, yeah. It really has that. Like, it's almost like Njira's character is living in this fantasy world and seeing the world in, in a very specific perspective. But Brea is doing the same, but it's a fantasy that is like mainstream reality for, for women of that age right now. So it's really kind of funny to see those two uh, versions of reality smash up against each other. Um, and I, I, I think she does a great job with it. That yeah, I'm so glad you mentioned Bria too, by the way, because I feel like right now she is just having so many fantastic moments in her career, which are so deserved. Um, but like, if you look at like what she's, what what's come out over like the last year and a half um, in terms of things that she's been involved with. Like I loved After Midnight, um, 12 Hour Shift was absolutely a blast. Um, and that was her directing. Lucky just recently hit Shudder uh, and that's phenomenal as well. Um, and, you know, and then you have the stylist, like that to me, like what a four movie run. Um, you know, and getting to work on both sides of the, of the equation for the, for those movies. It's just like so cool. Um, so I just love that we're sort of living in Bria Grant's world right now for a little bit. And I'm cool with that. Yeah. And again, it's with another thing that's so great about it is this, she's just this person who's going out there with a determination each day and, and putting in the work to make it happen. Like things aren't just um, magically uh, uh, being handed to her she's making things happen. And that's super inspiring for all of us. So win, win, win. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you there. Um, so the last movie that we have on our list to talk about um, that you mentioned, um, I had actually hadn't seen uh, until 
you gave me, uh, you were like, oh, let's talk about uh, The Bloodhound. Um, and I had missed it because I know recently, it just recently premiered an Arrow. I want to say like in January or February. And I, it, was, it was one of these movies that like, about 10 minutes, I was like, what is this movie? And then about 20 minutes, I was like, do I like this movie? And then about 40 minutes in, I'm like, I think I really like this movie. Um, and it's a really, it's really quick too. It like, it's, it's like an hour and 10 minutes, maybe total. Um, and it was just like, I had such a really interesting back and forth with it. And then ultimately what really sold it for me is the very last shot. Um, and you see how everything kind of comes together in the end. And I was like, oh, I think I really liked this movie a lot. Uh, so first of all, thank you for introducing me to the Bloodhound. Yeah, it was, it was, we were texted by a friend who said, hey, uh, my buddy was an editor on a movie that he thinks you might like. Will you check it out? Do you want to check it out? And it was like, sure. So got a link through a text through a friend. You know, so we knew nothing about it. And we were watching it and my partner was watching it with me. And we had a similar experience with you as you did, where it was sort of like, what is this? And I think that's the thing, you know, the reason why I recommended it beyond how uh, well it's made. It is such a, um, the experience of watching it is sort of like peeling back uh, layers of what the movie's doing and, and why it's doing it. It's, it's, it is, it's so like outside of what most sort of genre cinema is doing, which is like, here's a bunch of information and we're going to watch what happens next. This is like giving you very little information and doing it with like a very severe formal aesthetic. And you can't tell if it's serious or a comedy, if it's actually scary, it, what's going on. And it's just such a unique viewing experience because of it that uh, I really thought we should talk about it and encourage people to check it out. Patrick Absolutely. Burr, amazing, amazing uh, uh, debut feature, fresh out of AFI. And this is his first thing. It's like, yeah, I'm excited to, uh, to you know, for his next movie. Yeah, it was, it was interesting because like, there's, there's been sort of that longstanding joke of, um, cause like SNL did a ske sketch on it. Uh, where like if, if Wes Anderson did a horror movie, um, yeah. and I think in a way like this to me almost feels like if Wes Anderson did a horror movie, because it's very, there's a lot of quirky character things. It's, it doesn't fully lay out. It's like cards. So you have, to, you have to be paying attention. Um, so I was really glad because I watched it late last night, uh, when all the dogs were like finally settled, my other, my partner was in, was in bed. Cause you know, sometimes, you know, he'll talk a little bit and I'm like, this is the kind of movie where you really have to like be keyed in to yeah. really understand what is going on. And I don't mean it like, and then it's, it's complicated, but there's just so much, there's such a subtlety to the storytelling. But I was like, as soon as I finished, I was like, you know, and I was like, if, if, if Wes Anderson, like, I know it's like the funny thing that they did with like, you know, Owen, like the Owen Wilson type characters, but like, honestly, like I think if Wes Anderson were to make a horror movie, it very much would be in line with something like the Bloodhound. Yeah. Yeah. It definitely has that, that sort of aesthetic quality and that sort of rhythm and tonality. Um, and that's not to, not to diminish, you know, the originality of it. But oh it, no, it, not at all. Yeah, no, yeah, but we had the same thing too, or the same thought as well. And and you know, again, for you know, if you're looking for uh, uh, you know a standard horror film, this probably isn't going to have enough of uh, elements in it. But if it's before the pizzas arrived and you're looking for a way to warm up for uh, something unusual, this is the movie. Like there is, it is, it just flows at such a unique uh, rhythm that you're, you're, it's, it's the perfect opening feature for a double feature, I think. Yeah. And I think also too, um, Joe Adler in this movie, like you cannot take your eyes off of him because there is just such an, un, like, I don't want to say spontaneity because everything feels very deliberate with his performance, 
but it's like every time he opens his mouth, you don't really know what's going to come out because his character JP is just so unusual, like in just such a really fascinating way. Like this is a movie like I really want to go back and watch it again soon because I just want to like get that experience of really like, OK, now I've got it. Now I want to like find the context of everything because um, it really is fascinating just the way that the, the back and forth between uh, him and uh, uh, Francis in the movie. Um, there's yeah. just such a really interesting back and forth that they have. And it's, again, it's just one of those like, I'm really glad you recommended this. This is probably one of my one of my favorite sort of out of the blue movies that I've seen in a while. Nice. I'm glad you enjoyed it. We, we, we had a similar experience where it was just sort of, what is this? And at the end of it, we just sort of looked at each other and we're like, wow, that was awesome. So. Yeah. I was trying to think of like movies that I could pair it with. And I'm like, I just, I don't know. I really don't. Like I, as far as like maybe sort of more character driven on the fringe of genre, like maybe something like Swallow. But like, ultimately, this is a movie that I think is just, it's its own little beast. And I really appreciate that. Yeah, it's, it's, got a, it's got a sort of left of center feel that maybe you'd see in the movies of the 90s. You know, like something like Crispin Glover might have made or something. Like, you, <laughs> just, you're sort of like, wait, is this person fucking with me? Like, are they really? <laughs> like, are they being sincere or are they fucking with me? <laughs> like... And the whole movie feels like that, too, because you just don't even know. Like, you're just like, wait, what? Because there's a moment where, like, when Francis gets locked in the vault and I was like, oh, here we go. This is where it's going to turn. And you're just kind of like waiting for, like, the shoe to drop. And then it just the movie doesn't do what you're expecting it to do at all. And I think the way Patrick really like there's just such a deliberation with how he paces everything and just lets the movie breathe. Again, it's not a it's not a long movie at all. And yet there's just so many moments of just like air in this movie where it just really like, you're kind of like, Oh, okay. Because I think we're all sort of used to just sort of maybe faster paced, you know, storytelling because of like where, you know, a lot of modern movies are these days. Like I like a movie that'll just, it's, it's, it's almost like that line in Pulp Fiction where like, you know, people who aren't afraid to just sit in silence because, you know, just be comfortable in the silence. Um, except in this case, the silence is really uncomfortable. Um, but that's sort of the point of it. Yeah, and, and he, uh, Patrick and the cinematographer, Jake McGee, I think it's McGee, maybe McGee, like their shot selection and when they're cutting, because basically uh, two old friends reconnect. One of them is incredibly wealthy and lives in this house that's, you know, like a Frank Lloyd Wright uh, sort of dream Blade Runner, mid-century modern Tim Burton Frankenstein house. Like, you, how is this a real house is basically while you're in it the whole time. And what the director and the DP are doing with how they photograph the house and where they stage the action in the house and where they when they cut outside and, and to other rooms of the house while the action's unfolding is very precise and really uncomfortable in what it, it does because you sort of lose your bearings uh, over the course of the movie or in the course of the scene and all done with, with clear intention and it's kind of a marvel. Yeah, it really is. Um, so yeah, if you're if you're if you're sort of into quirky, I don't know, you said quirky makes it sound like kitschy, and it's yeah. not, but it's just it's so offbeat and different than anything that I've seen. And again, it's like, you know, you're probably in the same boat where you watch hundreds of movies a year. You just want a movie to come along and like make you stop dead in your tracks, right? Like any movie that can just make me take a moment and be like, oh shit, this is great, like. I am forever indebted because I will take that over a super polished, safe movie any day of the week. Yeah, I think and all the movies we talked about all have a unique personality. And that's they really do. That makes them so enjoyable. Absolutely. And I'm curious, you know, because again, you're somebody who sees a lot of movies and stuff like what, you know, beyond like the movies that we talked about, like what keeps you excited about sort of the independent space 
you know, in this, you know, realm of horror? Is it, is it movies like this? Is it seeing new talent? I'm just curious from your perspective, like what keeps, what keeps you excited? You know, not even just like as a director and a producer and a writer, but like from a fan's perspective. Uh, ideas and execution. And, and they, the movie doesn't necessarily need to have both, but those are the, the two things that I, you know, really kind of respond to is like, what is the, at its core, what is the movie about? What is it trying to say? And is that something that I find interesting? And the other aspect is how is it conveying that? Um, and I think they're one of the benefits of, of sort of the generation of filmmakers growing up with um, creating content uh, on laptops, shooting stuff, YouTube videos, After Effects, all of that is, is we're getting a much more polished uh, uh, level of movie from filmmakers earlier in their career, um, which is exciting. And if that can be combined with the people who are doing really, really interesting ideas, then holy shit, that is, that's, that gives me uh, such a, you know, keeps my hunger up because I want more of that because, you know, you're consuming this as art and you're always looking for that thing that's going to make you feel something new. Um, so yeah, and, and I think in my own work, it's a similar sort of thing. It's finding movies that allow me to talk about something I find interesting and learning how to execute them with a more sophistication each time. Those, those are things that, that are, are motivating me personally as a filmmaker. Well, I was gonna ask because, you know, again, once this is out, like, you know, Jacob's wife will be out there, the, ba the baby is out into the world. Um, so I'm curious, like, you know, I know COVID in 2020 sort of made a lot of things kind of like basically the whole world was a bit on pause especially in the realm of filmmaking um but i'm curious like what comes next for you um have you are you getting ready to sort of figure out what that next step is do you know what that next step is yeah i mean uh the one of the benefits of the lockdown was it sort of froze the entire business and everybody in their houses. And that was an opportunity to, to work on new material without that sort of pressure to go out and immediately be working uh, because there just there weren't productions happening. So you could sort of sit and, and work on the material and come up with ideas. So um, I did a bunch of writing, uh, some features, uh, TV series pilots, and then, um, the project we're going out to cast with now, which is uh, another horror film and another sort of my take on a subgenre uh, of, of horror that we haven't seen a lot of recently. And uh, I think that's all I can say now, but uh, <laughs> hopefully, hopefully we'll be able to say more soon. That's awesome. Yeah, it's it's nice to, you know, at least after everything, you know, over the last 14, you know, 14 to 15 months, like, you know, there's a little bit of a light at the end of the tunnel and it feels real now. Like it hasn't felt real, I think, until like the last few weeks, at least for me. Um, but it, it finally feels like we're getting to that point where it's like, maybe we can all breathe a little bit easier. Um, I mean, nothing's, nothing's totally fixed, obviously. And the world still has a lot of things that it needs to deal with. But ultimately, it's I think this is the first time in a really long time where I've actually felt a little hopeful, which is nice because when you don't feel hopeful for such a long time, you know, it kind of it kind of wears you down a little bit. And I think, you know, I think a lot of us are just ready to start start looking towards the future. So I'm glad that you've got something that you are already honing in on, um, you know, to look forward to uh, doing in your career as well. Yeah, I mean, we. You know, we got to keep going, right? So, uh, <laughs> so I'm excited. I mean, I talked to a lot of filmmakers and, and it seems like whether they're big movies or small, people are feeling the creative uh, uh, juice right now. 
And I think we're going to, the next uh, couple of years is going to be a real bountiful harvest of uh, micro tiny movies with big ideas and big giant movies that had the time to really develop the script so that they really work. And they're not just the surface qualities, but they have some of the internal nutrition that old school, big budget movies used to have. And, you know, plenty of stuff in between. So I, I think we're going to, we're going to be eating like, there's, I'm not going to, I don't know. We're going to be, we're going to be filling our bellies with cinema. In the next couple of years. I'll say it like that. <laughs> yes. And I'm looking forward to it. It's funny. Cause you mentioned like sort of big budget movies. And it's interesting. Cause like, I was thinking about this because like a lot of horror movies now, even at the studio level, like a lot of them still, you know, they, they usually don't really go above 20 million unless it's like it. Um, which sort of, and I, I think even the first it, they sort of held back on the budget because they weren't sure how that was going to go. And then the second one, they really kind of, you know, I think gave Andy the, the money to do what he wanted to do with that one. Uh, but it was interesting because I was just, you know, they just released the Scream Factory Blu-ray for Event Horizon. And it still blew my mind that that movie was like a $60 million hardcore horror movie from a studio. Yeah because you just don't see movies like that anymore. Um, and I almost want like that kind of stuff to come back a little bit. Like as much as I'm loving the independent side, pushing things like I really want studios to go fast and wild with this stuff. Like, you know, it's, I, you know, I'm, a, I'm so excited for Candyman. I'm so excited for Halloween kills. Cannot wait for the next saw movie. You know, I'm ridiculously, uh, just ex over the moon about the fact that James Wan is making like a Jalo movie. Um, yeah. But I want to see like some really high concept, crazy shit um, because I just don't feel like we get that kind of stuff anymore from studios. Um, so I'm hoping maybe, you know, as they're sort of figuring out, you know, in the wake of everything that happened, like what their next are, you know, what their next moves are like, I want to see them playing a little fast and loose. I don't think it's going to happen, but a girl can dream. Yeah. Um, but I, I want more event horizons in this world. I want movies that are just like totally go for it at that level too, because I think ultimately that's when the, the, the genre thrives is like when movies at every level are sort of pushing boundaries. Uh, cause that's when you get the really cool shit, you know? Yeah. 100%. I, I would take that every day over a movie that you're, you know, where it's going every single moment of it. Like, give me something that's doing you know, even if it, if, if it, if at the end it feels, uh, uh, a bit uneven, I'll take the, the highs and the lows rather than just something that just plays it in the middle of the entire time. Yeah. I think essentially I just need more movies where Sam Neill plucks his eyes, eyeballs out. I think that's what I'm looking for yes. <laughs> at this point. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, Travis, this has been really a fantastic time for me. Um, and I hope you've had fun sort of chatting about, you know, your career, all the stuff that you've been able to do, the things you're working on now, and then getting to sort of uh, champion a few uh, recent uh, indie horror movies as well. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. And uh, I really appreciate getting a chance to, to talk about my work, but definitely talking about the people who are, are, are coming on their way up. Like that's, that's exciting too. So thank you. Oh, absolutely. Um, and for those of you listening, thank you so much for supporting Corpse Club. If you want to learn more about Corpse Club, you can visit uh, our website over at corpseclub.com for all of your daily news, reviews, and interviews, plus all of our amazing Indie Horror Month coverage. You can head over to dailydead.com uh, and be sure to follow us over at Twitter as well. And I have to give a huge thank you to our engineer, Brian, for always making us sound amazing every week. Um, Travis, it's been a real pleasure and hopefully we can have you back for the next one. Uh, to chat more movies because uh, I it's it's always great to get, be able to pick your brain. Yes, but the next time we're only going to talk about Event Horizon. Okay, I you're you're on because I could talk about that forever. <laughs> <Awesome>. So <laughs> thank you so so much, and for those of you listening, uh, thank you again for tuning in. And until next time, stay scary. Um.